Hi everyone, welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor comments on the situation. The decision to provide attackers was a poor one due to their extensive range of around 180 miles or more, depending on the target. Over Crimea, five missiles were fired, possibly four, but likely five. All but one were shot down, showcasing the significant quality of Russian air and missile defenses. The final missile, instead of being destroyed, was damaged and knocked off course, ultimately exploding over the Black Sea near the beach in question. The cluster munitions inside did not ignite or detonate for some reason and fell harmlessly to the ground. This interruption in the missile's mechanics, although people were killed and injured, prevented the lethal bomblets from causing more damage. The intention was not to harm those on the beach in Crimea, but damage occurred nonetheless. For Russians, it makes little difference whether they are killed by an exploding bombwood or nothing, but the bombwood came from the United States. He believes Mr. Putin and his government have shown considerable patience and restraint, avoiding retaliation. As Moscow does not seek war with the United States or NATO, it is Washington and its European allies that seem to desire conflict with Russia, though this desire has waned upon realizing Russia's strength. Currently, the situation in Ukraine is deteriorating rapidly. The Ukrainian government remains in Kiev only because Russia has chosen not to destroy it. A major operation involving Russian troops crossing the Dnieper River appears imminent, aiming to seize historically Russian cities like Odessa and Kharkiv. However, Moscow's lack of interest in further territorial control persists, driven by the absence of negotiations. In Europe, the situation is evolving. While Norway remains stable, the continent faces turmoil, with France on the verge of revolution. President Macron's tenure is nearing its end, and attempts to replace him with another globalist figure are unlikely to succeed. The French populace is awakening, and the nationalistic French army committed to the French state will not remain passive. A significant upheaval and subsequent resurgence of the French nation are expected, potentially altering the European landscape. Rumors of various strange occurrences abound. He notes that there is some discussion in a French outlet about seeking assistance from the UN, EU, and NATO to intervene in France to prevent the revolution. This idea is considered laughable, as NATO has rarely been effective with ground forces in such situations. The notion of introducing foreign ground forces into France recalls the failed attempt by the Brunswick troops from the Holy Roman Empire during the French Revolution of 1789-1790, which ended in failure. He believes France is heading towards significant turmoil, which will eventually shift the country's focus away from the war against Russia. He predicts that the future French government will likely renounce the war and turn inward, a trend he also expects to see in Germany, where the Germans are not the French. He anticipates a similar governmental change, leading Germany to distance itself from the conflict with Russia. In Washington, he sees a desperate effort to maintain the illusion of stability in Ukraine, hoping to keep Zelensky in power until the November elections to avoid the embarrassment of another failed withdrawal similar to the situation in Afghanistan. He argues that the same military incompetence that plagued the Afghanistan withdrawal would have occurred under any administration due to the same incompetent leaders. He believes that France is on the brink of a radical shift to the right as a means of saving the nation, with a substantial portion of the population feeling their country is at risk of collapse. Despite potential resistance from royal communists or globalists similar to Antifa or BLM, the general French populace is now fully aware of the situation and demanding immediate systemic change should Marine Le Pen win and come to power. He anticipates her tenure will be brief due to the overwhelming demand for rapid and significant reforms. The French people are no longer willing to wait for years to see changes. They seek immediate solutions to issues like street crime, immigration, and national strength. The next leader will only be a temporary figure, much like Alexander Kerensky, who lasted only a few months before failing to meet the demands of the Russian people for bread and peace, which ultimately led to Lenin's rise. He does not foresee a scenario where the right-wing movement in France would resort to the extreme violence of Lenin's regime, but he expects some level of upheaval due to long-standing pent-up frustration. The goal of the right is to restore order, national identity, culture, and strength without massive violence. On the topic of the U.S. military, he argues that the army is unprepared and incapable of effective offensive warfare. Noting a significant decline in its capabilities since the 1990s, he observes that the modern army lacks the strength and cohesion of its predecessors and is hindered by globalist diversity and inclusion policies.
while the Air Force could be used, he questions the level of domestic support and the overall cohesion of American society. He asserts that the U.S. is bluffing with its long-range strike weapons, with the Russians carefully monitoring and systematically destroying these systems and the personnel behind them. He warns that Western contractors in Ukraine are at great risk, as the Russians are likely to continue targeting these assets and their operators. He emphasizes that recent events, including the downing of the Global Hawk drone over the Black Sea, highlight a critical situation. The Russians claim that the Global Hawk was involved in targeting and data transfer for the M270 multiple launch rocket systems in Ukraine, but it's unclear if this claim is true. The Russians have warned that any further intelligence, reconnaissance, or surveillance platforms, whether manned or unmanned, entering their airspace or approaching it, will be shot down. In response, Brussels has proposed sending F-15 fighter jets for escort missions, a move that he believes will result in the destruction of those aircraft as well. The real question is whether Washington can mobilize American public support for a war against Russia if such a confrontation occurs. He sees no evidence that the American people would back a full-scale conflict with Russia and is increasingly convinced that most Europeans, unlike in past conflicts like the Balkans, are now wary of being drawn into such a situation. In countries like Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, there is growing concern about having military systems stationed on their soil and the risks of being targeted by Russian strikes. In Moldova, the situation is similar, with the government supporting NATO's globalist agenda while the population opposes the war. He argues that this disconnect between the government and the people undermines any potential effectiveness of using Moldovan airfields for strikes against Russia. He also notes that military personnel in Europe are now ordered to dress in civilian clothes off base due to rising hostility towards their presence. Regarding the potential for Russian retaliation, he asserts that the Russians do not bluff and will act on their threats. The past two years have seen promises of a NATO ground force in western Ukraine that never materialized, and he doubts that any new ground or naval strategies will succeed. He believes that the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea present greater opportunities for confrontation than the current air operations in Central Europe. He warns that sending additional unmanned aerial vehicles with intelligence and surveillance packages, along with manned aircraft for protection, will likely lead to their destruction by the Russians. He asserts that the current situation is not like 1965, when the Gulf of Tonkin incident was fabricated to justify the Vietnam War. Unlike that era, he believes that Washington, despite being disconnected from reality, is unlikely to provoke direct conflict with Russia due to a lack of public support for such a war. The American public has no appetite for a conflict with Russia, and the ruling class knows that pursuing this path would lead to political repercussions. Looking at Latin America, he highlights that countries like Mexico, Venezuela, and Cuba have historically been hostile to the United States and the West. Going back to the Spanish Civil War, these nations supported the communists against the nationalists. This historical context reflects America's soft underbelly, with millions of people crossing the Mexican border. Putin's strategy of horizontal escalation involves expanding conflict globally rather than engaging in direct confrontation. He notes that Putin has been active in various regions. For instance, President Trump's efforts in Hanoi aim to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, a plan supported by China and reluctantly accepted by Russia. China prefers a thriving, prosperous Korea over North Korea's current state of decline. While North Korea has been more of a Russian satellite, China views it as a potential source of conflict and instability. Putin's visit to Vietnam illustrates Russia's strategic maneuvering. Despite historical conflicts between China and Vietnam, the Vietnamese have maintained good relations with Russia due to past support in their war against the United States. Putin's engagement in the Middle East is driven by Middle Eastern elites' dissatisfaction with U.S. policies, which has fostered new alignments against the U.S. In Europe, current leaders are seen as lacking genuine interest in European welfare, instead pursuing a globalist agenda that undermines European identity by introducing millions of non-Europeans. This approach, he argues, is unsustainable and will come to an end, reflecting a broader discontent that will also affect the U.S.